Good morning. It is great to have you with us this morning. And if you would, if you have your Bibles, you'd turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And we're going to go ahead and start this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today and we just thank you for your blessings. And Lord, we just thank you for this day as we celebrate your death and resurrection on Calvary. And I just pray that you would be with me as I speak, as I preach your word this morning, that you would give me power. I pray that you would work in our hearts and our minds. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Several years ago when I was in high school, I played on a soccer team, and we had a tournament in Beaufort, South Carolina. And right outside of our hotel, there was only one restaurant. It was the only restaurant we had the option of eating at, so every night we went to that restaurant. I won't name the name of the restaurant. It was Denny's. But um, So one night, me and three of my friends went over, and we sat down. The waitress sat us down. She gave us our menus, and as she's giving us our menus, she said, what would you like? We said, well, could we actually look at the menu for a minute? So she's like, yes, I'll be right back. The table behind us, people came, sat down, ordered their food, got their food, ate their food, and left. And we have not seen the waitress again. So finally, we flagged down a waitress, get another waitress to come, and we order. And I ordered a, it was called a ballpark special. It had a burger, hot dog, fries. And my friend Matt said, that sounds pretty good. I'll take that too. So the waitress goes, and the people next table behind us, people come, they order, they get their food, they're eating, and the waitress comes back, and she said, there's a problem. We don't have any hot dogs. You'll have to order something else. So we each ordered something different. Goes on a few minutes later, the waitress comes back, and she says, oh, good news, we have one hot dog. And so I said, Matt, you can have it. I'll take the other thing. He said, no, no, you wanted it. You ordered it first. I said, no, Matt. I insist, I'll I'll take the turkey club. So he said, okay. So a few minutes later, the waitress comes back finally with our food. And she brought me something that neither one of us had ordered. But that was okay. And she brought Matt his burger and hot dog and fries. And so Matt eats the burger, the hot dog and fries. And as he's finishing up, he looks at me and said, Whitney, why did you decide you didn't want the burger and, and hot dog and fries? I said, Matt, did you consider where did they find one hot dog? I mean, I've never worked in a restaurant, but I kind of figure there's like, here's where we keep the hot dog wieners. Where did they suddenly find one hot dog? Did people on table eight not eat theirs? You know, were they sweeping behind the freezer and one had fallen? You you don't just find one hot dog. And Matt said, you know, I never considered that. And I learned a lesson that day, and Matt did too. There's some things in life we need to take the time to consider. There's sometimes we get so busy in life and there are important things that we should consider that we don't consider. And there is something this morning I want us to consider. I want us to think about. And it's found in the story in Luke chapter 23. Jesus has been arrested. He has been falsely accused of a crime. He has been tried. And he has been falsely condemned. And as we pick up our story this morning, he is being led to the cross to be crucified. And in Luke chapter 23, we see what's happening here in verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine. And saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged rattled on him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Here today we see two men. In many ways they are very similar. Both of them are thieves. Now, when we see this word thieves that they're described as in Matthew and Mark, we need to understand this is not a word used of pickpockets or even people that burglar in their house. This is a word used of bandits. These are men who would hide along the busy highways where people would travel and they would rob and pillage and attack. We would be better off thinking of, of the mob or, or of a violent gang. They would abuse, they would beat, they would murder, they would rape. These were violent, vicious men. Both of them had been caught. Both of them had been condemned. Both of them had been sentenced to execution. And here these men stand, one being crucified on the right and one on the left of Jesus. See, there's one other thing these men had in common. Both of them were equal distance to Jesus. Both of them could watch him. Both of them could listen to him. Both of them could speak to him. And we're told in the other Gospels that both of them began to mock him. Imagine these two men being crucified or mocking a man being crucified with them. As the crowd there, the soldiers, the others gathered around began to mock Jesus. These men joined him. But then these men began to take a different path. One of them began to think about what he had seen and heard. One of them had heard Pilate, the ruler of Rome, say, This man, I find no fault with him. And then he heard Pilate say, the charge against him is that this man is the king of the Jews. And, and the, the, the Jews said, no, don't say he's the king of the Jews. Say he called himself the king of the Jews. Say he called himself the Messiah. And Pilate said, no, what I've written, I've written. And Pilate testified that he believed this man was the king of the Jews. And then he watched as this man's hanging on the cross, dying. And when most thieves would cry out and say, Give us freedom, give us healing, let us go. This man thinks about those around him. And he says, Father, forgive these people who are killing me. They don't know what they're doing. And then he heard the crowd say, This man saved others. Let him save himself. This man saved others. And then he heard again as they said this man claimed he was the king, the Messiah, the promised one of God. And at some point he put these things together. And he said if he is willing to forgive others, maybe he'd be willing to forgive me. And, and if, if he has saved others, maybe, just maybe, he would save me. And if he is a king, maybe he will let me into his kingdom. He had watched Jesus suffer and be crucified with dignity, kindness, forgiveness, courage, and love. And he decided that this is the kind of king he wanted to serve forever. See, notice the difference in this thief and the other. This man made a statement. As the other criminal is blaspheming him and mocking Jesus, he says, do you not fear God? You see, one criminal only feared Rome. He only feared the justice and judgment of the cross. But the other criminal recognized that once Rome had gotten its judgment... Once Rome had gotten justice, they would face another judge. And so he realized that they needed to fear not only Rome, they needed to fear God. Not only that, he recognized his own sin and unworthiness. He says to that other criminal, he says, Do you not fear God, seeing we are under the same condemnation 
and we justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. He said, look, we deserve this. We deserve this justice. We are sinners. We are wicked. We deserve to die. But then he acknowledges the sinlessness of Christ. This man, that man hanging on the middle cross, has done nothing wrong. And then he recognizes Jesus as the Messiah and the King. They have said, if you are the King of the Jews, if you are the Messiah. And he says to him, when you come into your kingdom... When you begin to reign over your kingdom, remember me. He not only believes Jesus is a king, he believes Jesus will rise again. He believes that this death on the cross is not the end of Jesus. But that Jesus will reign in his kingdom. And then he cries out for grace. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He does not try to justify sin. He does not try to excuse his behavior. He does not give a list of things that he has done right. He cries out for mercy. Arthur Pink said he could not walk in the path of righteousness, for there was a nail in either foot. He could not perform any good works, for there was a nail through either hand. He could not turn over a new leaf and live a better life, for he was dying. The only thing he could do was cry out for mercy. You know, the only thing crazier than the request was that it was granted. The only thing crazier than this man, this criminal, this thief, asking God to remember him when he came into his kingdom, was that Jesus accepted the request. It's an amazing story. But it's not just the story of two thieves. It's your story and my story. See, our culture has told us that the dividing line of humanity is things like race or gender or sexual practice or income or nationality or political leanings or religion. They are wrong. The great demarcation is this. It is which side of the cross you are on. The great difference in men and women has always been and will always be which side of the cross we are on. Because every one of us is one of those two thieves. Every one of us is one of those two criminals. And today I want to ask you a simple question. Which side of the cross are you on? And there there are just a few things that I want to ask us to help us consider, to help us discover which side of the cross we're on. The first is this, do you fear God? That criminal who turned to Jesus, the first thing he recognized was the justice of God. Our culture has swung the pendulum Where we love to talk about the love of God. We love to talk about the grace of God. We love to talk about the mercy of God. But we've forgotten that there is also the wrath and justice of God. Look at what Romans 2 says. It says, For we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things as as sin and rebellion towards God. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things... And yet do them yourselves that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches and the kindness and the forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impertinent heart, you are stirring up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one of us according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Do you see those words, the judgment and wrath of God? 
See, the Bible says that all of us in our sin are under the wrath of God. Ephesians 5 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes on sons of disobedience. Revelation 6 says, In the king of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone slave and free, hid themselves in the caves among the rocks and the mountains, calling on the rocks and mountains, saying, Fall on us and hide us from the faith, face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who shall stand? One day, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the justice of God will be poured out on this world. And the Bible says that what can we do to hide ourselves from the wrath of God on that day? And we live in a culture that loves to talk about the love of God, but we don't like to talk about the wrath of God. But the Bible teaches that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Recently, my wife and I and one of our kids were driving down the road, and the speed limit suddenly lowered, and I didn't. And a police officer was kind enough to stop and tell me about my mistake. And he came over and said that the speed limit dropped to 35, and my speedometer did not. And you know what he also did? He told me that judgment would be carried out. He told me what the penalty for my crime was going to be. And you know what I could not do? I could not look at that police officer and say, Officer, I believe I get to make my own speed limit. I believe I get to decide what the speed limit is for me. You know what he would have said? No, you don't. And you know I couldn't say, Well, well, officer, you're telling me this is the punishment. I believe I should get to decide for myself what the punishment for breaking the law is. You know what he's going to tell me again? No, you don't. See, there's so many people who think that that they get to, to be the judge of right and wrong. That they get to be the one that determines what the punishment should be. No, the Bible says God is the judge of the universe. He created this world. He created this universe. And He established the laws And he established the penalty for those laws. And you and I might wish the laws were different, but that's not a decision we get to make. And the Bible says that the judge of the universe must do right. There is a judgment, there is a penalty, there is a punishment under the wrath of God. And the first question for you and I today is this, do you fear God? Do you see that all of us have sinned and are rightfully under the wrath and judgment of God. There's another thing that we need to recognize. Do you recognize your sinfulness? See, we need to take it a step further than just seeing that the world is broken. We need to acknowledge our sinfulness. That's what that criminal did on the cross. He said, we receive justly what we have done. Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that does good. There is none that understands. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and come short of God's standard and God's glory. See, this is vitally important. So many people, you ask them about going to heaven and and, and avoiding the, the, the death and wrath of God, and they say something like this, I've been a good person. I think God's going to let me into heaven and God's not going to punish me in the lake of fire hell for eternity because I've been a good person. And I would say, let's unpack that for a minute. By whose standard are you measuring good? God's standard says, thou shalt not lie. What do we call a person who lies? A liar. How many times do you have to lie to be a liar? Once. Have any of you ever lied before? You know what that makes us? That makes all of us liars. The Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. If you take something that doesn't belong to you, you've stolen. If you gossip, you've stolen someone's good name. And we say, Well, I haven't stolen that much, but you know what the truth is? All of us are thieves. We are lying thieves. The Bible says, thou shalt not murder. Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, you're guilty of murder. The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said, if a man looks after a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery in his heart. 
You know what, I've looked at four of the commandments, and I think most of us, if we're honest, are lying, thieving, murdering adulterers. We're not good people. Jesus puts it this way, he said, if you break the least of these commandments, you're guilty of breaking them all. Can you imagine me standing before an earthly judge, and the judge saying, Whitney, what do you have to say for yourself? I said, judge, I'm a good person. I think you're going to let me go free. And the judge looks and says, well, Whitney, wait a minute. I have here that you have been pled guilty to breaking every law in Arizona. Not only that, you've broken every federal law as well. Is that true? Yes, Your Honor, that's true. I thought you said you were a good person. Well, well, Your Honor, I am. I mean, yeah, I killed three people, but do you know all the people I haven't killed? And yes, I, 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 I lied about my taxes this year, but the year before, I didn't lie about my taxes. And yes, Your Honor, I've stolen, but I also gave money at the Salvation Army this year. Doesn't that good make up for what I've done wrong? What is that judge going to say? No, it doesn't. In fact, what would you think of a judge if that judge let me go free, having broken every law? We would look at that judge and say, that judge is evil. When the guilty go free, the judge is condemned. And we look at a system where we get very upset when our legal system does not do its job and allows the guilty to go free. And yet we look at a holy God, the judge of the universe, and say, God, I want you to be an evil judge that lets the guilty go free. If we would condemn an earthly judge for doing that, why would we not condemn the God of the universe for doing the same thing? See, you and I need to realize we are sinners. We are rightfully under the just wrath of God. In fact, the Bible says in Deuteronomy that the evil, that the wicked people, their feet will slip in due time. You and I, if we do not know Christ with our sin weighing on us, we are one step away from experiencing the wrath and justice and judgment of God. So you need to fear God. Do you recognize your sinlessness, your sinfulness? Thirdly, do you recognize the sinlessness of Christ? Here's where the story changes. You and I are rightfully under the wrath and justice of God. There is nothing on God's side that would condemn Him from this moment for judging you or I forever for our sin. But God is not only just, He also loves you. He loves me. And he loved us so much that he saw this huge debt that we owed for the penalty of sin. And he realized that there was nothing you or I could do to pay that penalty. So he stepped off the throne of glory. And he came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He became God and man. I love the way Anselm put this. One of the early church fathers. He said, people ask, why did God have to become man? And he said, the reason why is this, man owed a debt we could not pay. It was so great that only God could pay it. But God didn't owe the debt. We did. So God became man so that the one who owed the debt and the one who could pay the debt would be the same person. And Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. And unlike you and I, For over 30 years on this earth, he never sinned. He never lied. He never lusted. He never cheated. He never hated. And so 30 years later, he was hung on a cross, not for his sin, but for yours and mine. I heard a story. A man was with his family at Disney World, and they were over at Cinderella's Castle. And while they were there, he noticed what seemed like an earthquake, and then he realized it was just all the kids running. All the kids rushed to one side of the castle, and he was wondering, what is going on? And then he turned and saw what was going on. Cinderella had entered the castle. And there she was, the picture of beauty. Not a hair was out of place. She was as beautiful as a human woman could be. And all the kids 
circled around Cinderella, wanting to see her and touch her and talk to her. All of them except one little boy who stood over at the side. And the man said, you could look at this boy and, and you could see that his, his face and his body were broken with some disease and sickness. His face was deformed. He was crunched over. And he was holding the finger of what was probably an older brother. He said, you could look at that boy and see that boy wanted to run to Cinderella too. But he must have, years of rejection must have caused him to realize that there's no way Cinderella would reach out to him with all these other healthy children around. But that man said he noticed something. Cinderella was talking with the children in the crowd, and she looked over the heads and saw that little boy at the back of the crowd. And she gently but purposely made her way through the sea of children. And when she broke through, she went over to where that little boy was, and she knelt down. And she talked to that little boy. And then she gave that little boy a kiss on the head. And the man said she saw, he saw that little boy's face brighten. Cinderella gave him a gift. But you know what? Jesus did something else. He didn't just give us that gift. Why does Cinderella, rather than just giving him a kiss, had made a trade? What if she had taken her beauty... And given it to that boy for his deformity. What if he had, she had taken her health and giving him her health and taken on his brokenness? And what if she had taken her joy and traded it for his pain? That is what Jesus Christ did for you. He didn't just come and kiss us while we were broken. No, look at what Isaiah said. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He who was sinless took our sin on himself. He took our brokenness, our deformity. He took it all on Himself. And even though you and I are sinners, Christ was sinless. And He loved you and I so much that He took all of that sin, all of that brokenness, all of that burden on Himself. Number four, do you embrace the resurrection? See, Jesus is unique in history. He alone lived before he was born and lived after he died. See, the death on the cross was not the end of Jesus. Three days later, after they laid him in that tomb, he arose. And we are here today celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do not serve a dead master. We serve a living Savior, a risen King. And he rose from the dead to show victory over death. And then finally, do you seek mercy? You see, ultimately, you and I have two options. We can try to stand before God on the day of judgment on our record. But as we've already talked about, our record is fallen. Or we can stand on the record of Jesus Christ. I read once of a guy who was uh, taking a, a final exam in college. It was a philosophy, introduction to philosophy course. And the problem he had is he was an average student. And he really needed an A on the exam to pass the class. There was only one problem. The teachers had a reputation that no one ever got an A on his final exam. In fact, it was so hard that the teacher would take a sheet of 8 by 11 sheet of notebook paper. And he would tell them, anything you can fit on this sheet of paper, you can use on your test. And kids would take magnifying glasses and write as small as they could on the front and back to get as much information as they could. And they still didn't get A's. And this guy was desperate. And he had an idea. His roommate had an older brother that was getting his doctorate in philosophy. 
And so he went to that guy's brother, and he said, I will pay you to come and help me on the exam. And the next day when the class came for the test, he stuck that sheet of paper on the ground. And his roommate's brother came and stood on the paper. And the professor came in and said, what's going on? And the kid said, you told us, you gave us your word that anything we could fit on one sheet of paper we could use to help us on the exam. And the professor stopped and thought. He said, you're right, I did. But if either one of his feet come off that paper, he's out. That kid became the first student ever to make an A on that test. He realized that there was no way he was going to pass on his own record. He needed someone to come and stand and take that test in his place. You and I are never going to pass God's standard. But Jesus can. And you know what, in essence, we can do is when we stand before the throne of God on the day of judgment, I can stand on the record of Whitney Walters and I will fail the test. Or I can stand on the sinless record of Jesus Christ. That's mercy. And you know what happens to those who fear God, who recognize their sinfulness, who realize the sin sinlessness of Christ, who embrace the resurrection of Jesus, and who seek mercy? They find grace. You see, grace is not merited, it's not earned, it's not deserved. It is a free gift. And the Bible says that if you would turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus, he would save us. The Bible says, though our sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now there are two questions that might come from this. One question is, why should I decide today? I mean, this, this, this criminal, in his last breath, cried out to Jesus. Why don't I wait till my last breath? There are three reasons I would say to that. Number one, you don't know when your last breath is going to be. You know, this criminal, we, we could look and say he took his last chance, but it also may have been his first. We don't know that he'd ever met Jesus before. We don't know he ever heard Jesus. What we do know is this. When the opportunity was given, that penitent thief embraced it. And you and I don't know when our last breath is going to come. Your last breath may come today. Not only that, the Bible says that every time we encounter the power of God, we are changed. Either our hearts are hardened when we reject Him, or they are softened as we respond to Him. In Hebrews 3 it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your heart. When I was first in ministry, I was working with some teenagers. A friend and I, Mark, were working with them at a small country church. And a girl, Allison, started coming. One of her friends invited her, and she started coming. And she wasn't a believer, but she came, and you started seeing God working in her heart. And one night, Mark, the other, the other guy that was helping there, was, was sharing the gospel. And you could see that Allison was under conviction. She was literally shaking. You could see the Holy Spirit was working in her life. And afterwards, some people talked to her and said, Would you like to accept Christ? And she said, Not right now. And Mark told her, he said, Look, what would happen if you were to leave here, and you were to drive down the road, and you were to get in a wreck? and you were to die, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? And she said, that's not going to happen. And he said, you don't know. And she said, I'll do it sometime, just not tonight. She got in the car, she left. About 20 or 30 minutes later, everybody's around talking, and some people came up very frightened. And they said, there's been a wreck right down the road. Allison's car was in the wreck. Fortunately, Allison survived. She was okay. As she got out, we were helping her. She was shaken. And as she got settled, Mark looked at her and said, Allison, you remember that wreck that wasn't going to happen? God has just given you another chance. And she was clenching the chair in front of her. She had tears running down her face. She was shaken. And she said, not tonight. Saw her about two more times. She came, but... You could tell she was different. 
God's conviction wasn't there. Her heart had hardened and she left and we never saw her again. If God is speaking to you, today is the day of salvation. Finally, God wants what's best for your life. And you don't have to waste your life by waiting to the end to enjoy the joy of Christ. If God is working in your heart, today is the day of salvation. Finally, one other question that may come to mind. Why would God do it for me? Why would Jesus die for me? Why would Jesus save me? You don't know, Pastor, what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what's going on in my life right now. And a lot of people say, maybe if I could get my life straightened out. Someone said waiting to come to Christ after you get your life cleaned up is like waiting until you get the bleeding stopped to go to the emergency room. God doesn't love some future version of you. He loves us in our mess. Think about that criminal on the cross. He was never going to get baptized. He was never going to go to church. He was never going to give a dime or tell one person about Jesus. He was about to die. Why would Jesus save him? The same reason Jesus wants to save you. There's one story I want to tell you, and we're through. Heard about a man whose wife liked to go to garage sales. And she had been kind of nagging him to go, so finally he said he'd go with her on Saturday. And Saturday morning came around, and 5.30 she's waking him up, saying, it's late, we got to get going. And he's thinking, it's Saturday morning, you know, I was thinking, like, get up around 8, have a late breakfast, then go, but she wanted to go right away. So they went. And they walked around, looked at different places, drove around, and finally one of the places he was looking at, there was an old, beat-up, rusty Harley-Davidson motorcycle. And he asked the lady at the garage sale there, he said, is this motorcycle for sale? She said, I never thought about it. It's just a piece of junk. We really need to throw it away. But sure, you can have it. How much will you give me for it? And they negotiated a price, and he said he'd come back later that day with his truck and pick it up. He did. He stuck it in his garage, and then he did what all good men do with a project like that. He let it sit for a while. And his wife said, honey, why would you buy that motorcycle if you're never going to do anything with it? So finally he decided to do something with it, but he figured the first thing he needed to do was call Harley Davidson and find out what model and what parts he needed. So he called Harley Davidson and gave the man there the serial number. And the man said, hold on a second. And he put him on hold. And he came back and the man at Harley Davidson said, sir, I've been authorized to give you $50,000 for that motorcycle. And the man said, why? And the man at Harley Davidson said, I can't tell you that. And the guy said, look, I, I'm not selling you this motorcycle. Until you tell me a rusty, beat-up motorcycle that doesn't run, why is it worth $50,000 to Harley Davidson? And the man said, hold on. And he put him on hold again. He went back and came back and said, I'll offer you $100,000 for that motorcycle. And the man said, why? And he said, I can't tell you. And so on it went, $150,000, $200,000, $300,000, $500,000. Finally, he said, sir, we're willing to offer you a million dollars for that motorcycle. The man said, sir, you could have my wife for a million dollars. But I am not giving you a mil- that motorcycle until you tell me why a rusty, beat-up, piece-of-junk motorcycle is worth a million dollars to Harley-Davidson when they haven't even seen it. And the guy said, sir, before I tell you that, I need you to do something for me. Go take the seat off the motorcycle, flip it over, and tell me if it says anything. And he went and he took the seat off and he flipped it over. And on the bottom were these words, to the king. That motorcycle had been personally made for Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Its value was not in its appearance or its performance. Its value was found in the fact that it was made for the king. I want you to know something. You have a value. Your value is not in your appearance or your intelligence or your past or your performance. Your value is not found in what you might offer or give to God. Your value is found that the king of kings made you for himself and he loves you. And if you would do what that criminal on the cross did, you would find the same grace and mercy he found. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, the Bible says if we would repent of our sin 
and accept him as our Savior, he would save us. Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your blessing. And we just pray for each person here who's heard your word that you would have free reign in the hearts and minds. And if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that today might be the day that they call out to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.